Hey, listeners. So we've got a little bit of a different episode today. You know, quite often on the show, we talk about books. We talk about the books that some of our guests have written. And one of the things that you may not know is that I receive books all the time. People are mailing books in. Most of the time, they don't follow up. They don't ask if they can send a book. They don't even let me know that, that they're going to send a book. They just kind of grab the address from the website and send a book. And awesome. You know, I appreciate that. I read those books when I can. But today, we're going to talk about a book that's a little bit different. And I am joined by the author, Mr. Lewis Martin. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks, Jeremy, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. You came highly recommended. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, we, 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 we have to get out there and, and fix all that. <laughs> I can't can't be known as a as a good place to to go to. Yeah, then you'll get more books. Oh, I know. It'll be it'll become Marshall Bookcast or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it's important, I think, that the listeners know why you're here and why so many others aren't. I mean, we've had plenty of authors, but honestly, listeners, the number of books that come in is kind of ridiculous. But there was something really unique, not only in your book, in the subject matter, but also in the way that you wrote it. And I, I'm doing my best to, to raise some anticipation here. So let me step back and why don't you tell the listeners about your book and you know what's in, what's in those pages? Uh, I will. Um... Man, I'm anticipating it now. <laughs> you built it up good. You know, this is a book about um, kind of the darker side of martial arts. It's a side that exists. Everyone, you know, within our gyms and dojos, we acknowledge it and we talk about it. But there's, uh, as far as I can tell, not a lot of books that have been written on it. And it's really about fanaticism and obsession and uh, maybe a little bit of abuse of power in martial arts. Um, I was part of a martial arts organization for about seven years. It was a really large organization. It existed primarily in California, uh, Northern California, but we also were international. We had schools in um, Puerto Rico, Europe. We had a couple schools uh, in Alaska. Uh, there's a, a, it's headquartered in Japan now. It used to be headquartered in Monterey, California. That's where I trained. And on the outside, this was uh, sort of a traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu, Aiki jiu-jitsu school. And that's why I joined it. And that was my interest. I had never done martial arts before I started when I was 19. But over the years, what I learned is that this was essentially a, a new age self-help system that was packaged as a martial arts school. But the more you got into it, the martial arts sort of faded a little bit more in the background. And this, like I said, kind of self-help system really came to the forefront and it became more of a spiritual journey of kind of realizing your potential. The martial arts teachers were became sort of spiritual mentors and it wrapped a lot of us up in it, including myself. And that's why the book is called The True Believers, because we we were not just dedicated martial arts students. I mean, we felt like we were on a greater mission to enlighten the world, fix everybody, fix ourselves. And in the process, you know, a lot of us inadvertently destroyed our lives because we sacrificed so much in in service to the system and its teacher, who was our, our martial arts master. Now, the things that you're saying, there are folks listening, and, and I'm going to guess that they're coming down on, on one of two sides, because there's not a whole lot of gray here. They're listening to your words and they're thinking, yeah, I've heard people talk about martial arts schools that way. I, maybe they've even heard others speak about the school they attend that way. And I've attended schools where people will say, you know, oh, this, this place is, is a cult and, and, you know, everybody just kisses the instructor's butt. And then, you, you know, but it's just, it's, it's a cynical approach that that's really not what it is that, you know, He's just, he doesn't understand. And then there may be mm -hmm. others listening thinking, oh, I've never been to a school like that, or, or maybe I have, and, and I can totally see what he's talking about. Now, I've read the book, so I know what you're talking about. And I would love for you to give the listeners a bit of context without giving 
too much away because listeners, I think you all should read this book. If we talk when we when we think take a step back, when we look at a lot of the subjects that are coming up on the show over and over again, whether it's a Thursday show or a Monday show, ego and self delusion, uh, the the authority of rank and and that whole ball of wax. This book is a perfect example of how it can go wrong. So I'd love for you to give the listeners a bit of context for the reality that was your life for seven years. Well, you said something inter- interesting about the gray area. And I think that um, why this book was important and why it had to be written the way I wrote it was that there was a lot of gray area. It was seven years of gray area. And it was it was me and others constantly questioning is this normal? And we had just enough reason to say, eh, it's probably not that big a deal to sort of keep going. And because of that, when I wrote the book, I realized that it deserves some nuance because it's a nuanced thing. Uh, I didn't, you know, I felt like the story deserved to be told in, in a fair way. I mean, I didn't just call the book, hey, I was in a martial arts cult. Um, and actually, I never call uh, Seibukan Jiu-Jitsu, a cult in the book, because I really don't think it is. I was just reading this morning about this crazy cult where they were branding people in New York and it was a whole sex slave operation. And I, I read that article. I was like, well, that was a real cult. You know, I'm not sure if we were on that level, but we were just on that line, you know, where it was, it was something that I think a lot of people can read it and maybe think about schools that they've seen or been involved with and been like, yeah, I could see a little bit of that. But we were probably a little bit more extreme than what your listeners are thinking of. Like I said, we we had a whole philosophical system that, you know, we treated like a religion. And the, the martial arts training was a part of that. So, you know, we were training a lot, getting promoted, learning really pretty good Japanese style jujitsu. But as we advanced in the system, you also kind of advanced in this the steps of enlightenment where you had incentive to keep training, not just because you would acquire new physical skills, but that you would get to like a deeper level of understanding. And a lot of it was, you know, kind of wrapped up in Japanese Shinto mysticism of, you know, spiritual animals and and elements. And there were seven gates and 21 concepts. I mean, it was really deep. And of course, the founder of the system was the, the man that we trained under. And he was the one that he had created it and and he had meditated on on a rock for for 7 days or something and and gotten this vision from you know the powers of the universe and we really looked to him as as our sort of spiritual leader there was a lot of competition for his time and his attention and i was certainly a part of that i mean i every everything i say i'm kind of pointing the finger at myself too but i was a kid you know i was i was 19 um by the time i left i i was 27, I, I had started to kind of figure things out, think a little bit more independently. But a lot of us were kids and we just, we didn't know any better. We wanted to be a part of something. When you look at that time that you were in this school, what changed, if anything? Was it, because if you, if you, I'm going to guess that if you had the same knowledge and perspective that on the day you left at age 27, you wouldn't have made it past day one at age 19. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. So was it just your knowledge, your experience, or was the way things were being done different over that time too? That's a great question. It was both. So there were internal things that were changing and there were external things happening to me. Internally, I came to this school in 2006, and at that point, it was just starting to really intensify in that the the martial aspect was always there, but the the philosophy of the martial art was really starting to ramp up and become kind of intertwined. We were starting to treat uh, our, our teacher with kind of a sort of a mystical reverence and attributing, you know, pseudo magical powers to him. And... By, I'd say, 2009, 2010, that stuff hit its peak where 
we were, I mean, we were really, really deep in this philosophical system and, you know, we were attributing that it was changing our lives and that we were going to change the world with it. We were kind of isolating ourselves from other people that were outside the system. I was isolating myself, you know, maybe a bit from my family and, you know, even from my, my, uh, my girlfriend who would end up being my wife and and I attribute her for, you know, saving me from a lot of this stuff. So that was the internal. It just got way more intense. And then externally, I was really into martial arts, Jeremy, and I I wanted to cross train and learn other things. And cross training was generally frowned upon in our style as a way to sort of insulate ourselves. We, We cross trained within the dojo. So we would train in other kind of martial arts, but it was all the same people and it was our same instructor, master, you know, cross training us. It wasn't real cross training, but I was doing that and I was coming across one other schools that were not like we were, you know, they didn't have this, this true believer vibe going around. And then two, you know, I came across some people that were really good at, at real fighting arts that, you know, physically could just destroy me. And that was a big eye opener that, you know, all these incredible things that I thought I could do weren't, weren't really working at all on them. And it started to kind of sow the seeds of doubt over the years. What was it about where you were at, at age 19 that allowed this to happen, and if and if you go into this in the book, you know I, I remember the the generalities of the book, right? I've, I've read the book, but certainly you know the book better than I do. I'd like for you to tell. I'm going to ask this a different way. I'd like for you to describe to the listeners what kind of a person you were at age 19. You know, just before you stepped into this school. Well, I think there was nothing special about me. I was where a lot of 19 year olds are which is I was starting this process of individualizing. I was moving away from home, leaving my my parents and my family. Um, and I was open to new things. And I was, you know, when you're 19, you're feeling out, okay, who am I going to be? Like, what is my identity? What are my personal values? And a lot of us, you know, when we're young like that, we're thinking and we're realizing, oh, the values that my family had or that the group I had before that kind of socialized me doesn't have to be my values. I could be a whole new person. And that's why I think when you're young, you know, people talk about being young and impressionable. And, and that's what I was. I was I wanted to find a new identity, a new sense of belonging. And I walked into a martial arts school because that was something I thought that I wanted to do. And I saw this incredible community and they had a sense of unity and and they kind of leaned on each other and I was just ready and and I wasn't you know worldly enough to question a lot of it you know it seemed normal to me um I I had nothing to really compare it to and that's something that over the years as I got older I realized that our uh martial arts organization was really tending to recruit younger people like I had been and, you know, I don't know if they had done it nefariously. I don't think they had done it nefariously, honestly. But I think that it's just something about younger people and true believers go hand in hand. And that's why uh, the average age of the students over the years tended to get younger. Like when I walked in, you know, it's a pretty well-balanced people, uh, a group of people. Some were older in their 40s with families. And then they ran the gamut from, you know, the 30s to the 20s to the teens but by the time I left, I mean, it was a lot of early 20s students that were basically the heads of the organization seen as kind of spiritual leaders. I mean, 23, 24 year olds that were seventh degree black belts, you know, seen as masters. And in your voice, it sounds like you have an issue with that. Um, yeah, sure, I do. I think, you know. I, this was uh, sort of a key trait in our system was that we promoted quickly and that you could get your black belt in a year. You could get it in less than a year. Sometimes I got mine in nine months and then you could keep getting degrees of black belts at a regular pace. Um, some people could get a, a, you know, their second, third degree within six months and they could be, um, you know, a 10th Don within, you know, four five, six years. And, 
I, I mean, do I have a problem with that? Yeah, if their skill doesn't correlate to that. But two, that's, you know, if you're really young and you're a seventh degree black belt, you're the person that gave you that is not setting you up for success and credibility throughout the martial arts world. You're going to constantly be in this position of defending yourself, defending your belt, defending, you know, your experience. And I've kind of come to believe that, you know, if I'm an instructor, a big part of me promoting a student is I'm putting my name on this student and then I'm going to send this student out into the world and they need to have credibility. Otherwise, it's going to affect me and my integrity and my reputation. Why did you write this? And and let me explain why I'm asking that question. Because in writing this, there's a tremendous amount of vulnerability. You're telling the world, here's what happened. Here's what happened with you. You're opening who you are and talking about a very nuanced time in your life and saying to everyone, hey, this is me. This is what happened. You can you can learn more about it. You can see who I am. Because who you are now, of course, is in part because of what you've gone through. So why, in, in a day when so many people will keep their vulnerabilities tucked away, would you do this? It's funny, my editor asked me the same thing, Stephen. That was the very first thing he asked me, why? <laughs> Uh, after he read the the first draft. And at that time, I didn't really know why I had written it. And I told him that, and he, his response was, I can tell, because it comes out in the writing. You, you're not really clear on everything that you went through, and your lack of clarity came through in the writing. And that's why I, you know, I had to write several drafts. But I've kind of honed it in since then. So there's there's three people I wrote it for, and... They go in this order. One is the students in Seibukan Jiu-Jitsu. I wrote it primarily for them. Um, they deserve to have the story told, and they deserve to have it told in a way that is that is fair and honest. Um, and I hope that I've done it with an integrity that they can be proud of it and, and um, hopefully experience some healing from it. Second person I wrote it for is myself. Um, this was a year long process of writing it. And I'm sure you can imagine it, it was um, a healing process for me because it forced me to walk myself through a lot of things I hadn't thought about. And I came to a lot of revelations about myself and, you know, what is it about me that I need to address because I'm not going to just point fingers at everyone else. I mean, I need to take some responsibility and say, you know, there was something in you that you were drawn to this, that you needed this, and you were a participant in this. Um, and I think I figured out a lot of what that was. And the third group of people, way kind of in the back, is everyone else. You know, this is not an uncommon thing in martial arts. I think, well, I think my situation was uncommon, but um, this is stuff people talk about all the time and people kind of whisper about in the in the backs of the dojos. Oh, I heard about this group, or did you see these people on YouTube? And and, you know, when you see these crazy kind of people on, on YouTube doing crazy techniques, you know, it's funny, but you ha also have to have some empathy and realize, you know, some of those people could be really brainwashed and they could be really putting themselves in danger, like mental danger of, you know, surrendering their identity to, you know, someone that is a, a con artist or doesn't have their best in intentions in mind. Um, or they could be physically putting themselves in danger by being completely delusional and then, you know, going forth in the world with this false sense of security. It sounds like you don't hold really anything against anybody in this story. I mean, just the way you wrote the book and the way you're talking now, it, it's very kind of matter of fact. And, and that's striking me as interesting because I think a lot of times if someone... Well, no, I, I don't want to put any more words on that. I, I'll just turn the question over to you. Am I am I reading that right? Are you are you not blaming anyone for anything? No, not really. I mean, these were all good people. Um, even even Concho, our our master, I think he was essentially a good person. That things sort of got 
away from him. Things sort of got out of hand. And there's reasons for that. I mean, he had uh, he had hundreds of adoring students that that thought that he was essentially more than a man. And and we put a lot of pressure on him to not just teach us martial arts, but to kind of fix us and fix our lives. And he he was forced into this role of therapist and then spiritual leader. And he stepped up to the plate in in all the wrong ways. Um, but and again, I, I don't want to give too much of the book away. There was a couple people I think were that were objectively bad because at the the very high levels of of the art, um, there was, in my opinion, and other people have made similar allegations. Uh, I think there was some serious abuse going on, abuse of power, abuse of people, and um, and even some sexual abuse. But you've stopped short of calling it a cult. So I'm, I'm curious, where does that line fall for you? It's tricky. I, you know, I looked up definitions of cults and things like that. And, you know, were we on that level? I would say no, especially when I read about like real cults where people are dying and, you know, all sorts of, of in, you know, incredibly uh, abhorrent things are happening. But I think that, you know, we were treating Seibu Khan and its self-help system in a religious way. I mean, it was it was filling a slot in our lives that most people would assign religion to that slot. It was it was a, a vehicle of kind of salvation. And, you know, we didn't have any deities or gods or anything like that. But we certainly had a guru um, that we saw as you know, kind of the all knowing guy that had everything figured out. And, you know, do I think it was a cult? No. Do I think that we stopped just short? Yeah. Well, listeners, we'll start to wrap up here. But one of the things I think it's important to say, because I don't believe I said this yet. We do not take anything ever for the folks who come on this show, whether it's, you know, a uh, someone who, I mean, very plainly has has something to plug, or even if it's a little more subtle, it is always entirely based on our own internal decisions who comes on this show, and it is exclusively because we want to present the things that we think are going to best resonate with you, the audience. There are some podcasts popping up now where it's starting to become pretty clear that they've made a name for themselves and and I'm not this is not in the martial arts space so don't speculate there. And the guests it it seems pretty clear that there's a financial arrangement there. That is not us. It's never been us. It will never be us. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. So Lewis, as we start to wind down here, why don't you tell folks where they can get the book and maybe there's a way they can get a hold of you if somebody wants to follow up with you or or anything like that. Yeah, I meant to ask you, do you want cash or check? <laughs> Bitcoin. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No money. Um, okay, uh, what did you ask where people can find it? Yeah, yeah let, I mean, the, the the most important piece of information, where can people find the book? Let's start uh, there. You can find it on Amazon. The title of the book is The True Believers by Lewis Martin. My name is L-O-U-I-S. Everyone calls me Louis, but m- my name is Lewis Martin. Um, there's a ebook available. You can get it downloaded on the Kindle app on your phone or your actual Kindle. And then there's the paperback version as well. Um, I not making hundreds of thousands of dollars from this. I think some people think I am, but I'm, you know, I'm making very little, uh, money from this. Uh, it's, it's really something that it's, it's the, everyone that I wanted and to read it already has and has messaged me. So everything from here on out is kind of extra credit. Yeah, everybody that thinks authors tend to make a lot of money are not authors. I have written several books, and as I tell people, the book division of Whistlekick brings in dollars every month, (laughs) you know, like eight to nine dollars. It's amazing. I put in that year of work on that book, and whoo, it's going to pay off one of these days. But (laughs) yeah, I read the other day in the in the book space about. 10% 10% of the authors make about 80% of the revenue. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. And there's like 100,000 books written every year or something like that. Wow. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me, actually. Yeah. 
And if people want to get a hold of you, are you willing to be, be public with some manner of communication? Um, you know, I have an author page on Amazon. I think you can get a hold of me that way. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you know, I'm pretty low key. I don't have an author website or anything. You can find me on, on Facebook. I'm Lewis Martin. Um, I think on, uh, Instagram, I'm like LJM three or something like that. Uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, you can, Okay. you just got to hunt for me. Sure. And you know, our audience is, is pretty kind. If anybody's going to catch the hate, it's generally me. And, uh, fortunately we, we don't see a lot of it coming in, but yeah, everyone's been really great. I haven't gotten hardly any, you know, blowback or negative feedback, Good. uh, since I wrote this. Good. Because the story, as I read it, you were painfully objective at times. It was really clear how important it was to you that you be fair to everyone involved. And that's something that, you know, as someone who helps facilitate others telling their stories, I know how much of a challenge that can be. And that was part of the reason I wanted to have you on the show. So I, I appreciate you being here. Listeners, of course, as always, you know, we'll, we'll drop the link to that book over on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So if you're driving or something, you don't have to, you know, crash while you write it down. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. When I was a kid, my um, my mom and sister used to fight a lot, and I I remember, you know, they'd finish fighting, and I'd go to my sister's room, and she would complain to me, and and I, you know, was put in this position to like have to be between her and my mom, and then and my mom would drive me to school, and she'd kind of complain about her sister, and I was in the same position, and I really attribute that to um where I got my sense of object neutrality, mm. that that's something I really value as a, as a characteristic of me. Um, and other people have commented on that, that like, Oh wow, you're usually really neutral. Um, and that was a challenge with writing this book was that I would probably throw myself pretty clearly in one camp. Um, and in, in some ways I did, I mean, I, there's definitely some bridges that I burned, but not nearly as many as I, as I worried about. What was the hardest part about writing the book? Definitely releasing it. The The book itself, writing it was really enjoyable. I, I loved um, the editing process, which I didn't think I would like. Um, I, I loved just rewriting it over and over and just making it a little bit better and a little bit better. But once I got to the, you know, the five yard line and it was it was like, OK, there's there's nothing left to do but publish this and, and click that button that was really tough for me because I started mentally thinking of almost every person individually that I knew and what would they think and what would they think. And my need to kind of please people and get along with everyone kicked into overdrive. And I had to admit to myself that you, know, you can't make everyone happy. You can't make everyone like you and like the book. And you just need to be okay with putting this story out there and everyone's going to react how they did. And again, that was, I mentioned this earlier, that was one of those sort of self growth moments for me when I really was confronted with, um, you know, my need to, to make friends and, and keep friends and to kind of set that aside for a second and say, okay, this is bigger than, than you and, you know, uh, wanting to always be in the club. Um, and actually it, you know, it all worked out because I, I published it and basically every single day for about a month, I had someone that I used to train with contact me and say, I read the book and, you know, all of them thanked me for writing it. And not a single person was like, oh, I think you really overreacted. I think that that you're just uh, you're reading too much into this. Like no one said that at all. Everyone was like, I thought the same thing that you did. And I never said anything because I didn't want to be that person. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Thanks for talking about the book. And listeners, again, the true believers, go grab it on Amazon. Find the link at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Thanks for tuning in. I'm just going to finish up the, the outro here. We'll make it one seamless piece. So thanks for tuning in. And anybody that's new, anybody that's old, we end the show the same way every time. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.